So we need to talk about marketing ethics today. And as I sort of alluded to before, this is my area of interest. And it's the part of the class that I get really excited about. And students start looking at me like, what planet did this group just be down from? Because there's all of this stuff that's really, really hard to think about. And it's not necessarily easy. After this section on ethics, which we'll talk about today and on Tuesday, and maybe a little bit on Thursday, finishing up, students are often left with more questions than they are uh, answers about what is ethical in marketing, right? You probably walked in here and thought, well, I sort of know what's ethical because I know what my gut instinct says to do. And it turns out that, that this is maybe not necessarily as easy as it first appears when we think about some of these things. <coughs> now, if you go on, and I would encourage those of you who are interested in pursuing this kind of career uh, path, and you want to be a college professor, it's, um, it's not a bad lifestyle, particularly if you get a PhD in the correct field, something like marketing, where the average salaries are well over six figures a year for marketers uh, with the PhD. Um, that's not true in every field. It's certainly not true in most of the liberal arts fields. Their salaries are considerably less. But it's still a nice lifestyle. When I started out, I started out as a political science professor here. And from time to time, students would come and they would say to me, you know, I kind of like this political science thing. You got me interested in politics and government, and I don't want to end up as pathetic as you are, so what can I do if I get a degree in political science? And I'd say, well, there's lots of stuff you can do, right? So then I, I switched to the college business. I was a lawyer for the, uh, for the institution, and then I went and got the PhD in, in marketing. So um, my undergraduate degrees and my master's degree are in, are in political science. My first doctorate is obviously in law and then the PhD. PhD stands for, and it's the pinnacle of the academic degree, right? Um, aside from some specialized doctorates, like the law degree, which is a Juris Doctorate, um, and that's the highest degree awarded by most law schools, um, there is something called an SJD, which is awarded by a few law schools. It's supposed to be even higher than a, it's a specialized uh, Juris Doctorate. Um, the medical doctorate is the highest degree awarded. But in most other fields, they award you a degree in philosophy, right? The doctor of philosophy. And in order to get that degree, you re take remarkably few philosophy courses in the PhD program. So why do we call it a doctor of philosophy, would you guess? Because you have to write a, a dissertation, that's correct, and it has to be original uh, scholarship that contributes to the body of knowledge, right? And that's what philosophy is. It's You take a lot of courses in your PhD in substantive areas like marketing management, consumer behavior, uh, research methodology, and things like that, um, so that you can contribute to the body of knowledge. So what is it that philosophy does? When we say philosophy itself, what is it that, that as, as a discipline, this attempts to uh, deal with? Kind of a guider. Knowledge here. Who else has something to, to add to that? What do you think of when you think of philosophy? Aristotle. You think of Aristotle, right? Guys in white kind of togas sitting around Greece. Um, one of the things that I think is interesting is a debate on did the Greeks invent philosophy, right? Uh, what is philosophy? Did the Greeks invent it? I think you think, can make a pretty good argument that maybe the ancient Greeks, about 2,500 years ago, did invent philosophy. Um, so what else do you think about? So you think about Aristotle. What else? I think about open minded. You okay. Open mind and right. Okay, so an expansion of the mind. That's why it is called the liberal arts, right? Because they liberate your mind. Um, as I said, this is the stuff that's really kind of hard. I think, from my perspective, 
what philosophy does is it attempts to answer three great questions. And so we'll talk a little bit about in here. You mentioned Aristotle. We'll talk about some of these guys. And students often say to me, what did these guys that lived 2,500 years ago have to say that would be relevant today? Right? I mean, obviously, Aristotle couldn't possibly fathom all of the technology that we have, airplanes and cars and microwave ovens and all of that stuff which makes life so easy for us, right? Um, but these are what I call perennial issues that have faced all societies from the, the birth of civilization, when we abandon the primitive psyche. And we face these questions, and they are the question of knowledge. These are test questions. So the first is the question of knowledge. What is it we can know, and how can we know it? It turns out this may be more difficult than you think. You think you know a lot of stuff, don't you? You come here, you have to be a junior, you've gone through all of these classes at the undergraduate level, you're in the upper echelon of the educational elite population in the world. What percentage of our population actually attempts some level of college in the United States? Would you guess? Of high school graduates? No. Far less than that. Higher than 40%. 50% try some level of, of college. What percentage actually graduate with a bachelor's degree? 25%. About, about roughly 25%. So if you graduate, you're in the top quarter of the population in terms of knowledge. If we take that to a worldwide level, you're, you're even more elite, right? Because lots of places and lots of countries, they don't have the educational opportunities that we have in the United States. They don't have as many institutions. They don't have as many opportunities to enter the institutions that they do have because it's highly selective. When I was a foreign exchange student in Germany, they determined fairly early on whether or not you go to gymnasium, which is their high school that preps you for college. And, and not everybody goes to college, so you, you all are among the educational elite. And so you think you know a lot of stuff. What is this? Are you sure? Yeah. You're positive. What? Unless there's a more proper term for it. Okay, what do you think a more proper term for it would be? Big desk. A big desk. <laughs> okay, so we've got a disagreement here already. He says it's a table. He says it's a big desk. How do I know which it is? You guys did it. I don't know. I, 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 you know. I don't trust you. What is this? Why is it a table and not a desk? What? It has no drawers. So all desks have drawers. No? <laughs> so no table has a drawer. Some do? Yeah, a lot of tables actually, that's where you stored your silverware, right? I have a French country table in my home that has a big drawer in it. That's where the, the family, the, the people, it's a 300 year old table. You know, they put, the, they put the silverware in the drawer. What? Are you sure it's a table? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I thought, you know, all this time. So. All desks have drawers. Can you think of a desk that doesn't have a drawer? The desk you're sitting in. The desk, yeah, that, that looks like a desk-like object, doesn't it? Yes. Does it have a drawer? What about when you were a kid and you went to elementary school? What kind of desk did you have there? 
the open cubbyhole desk. Yeah, how many of you had those? Okay, a lot. So we've got some examples of desks that don't have drawers that have cubby holes. So I, I, I'm wondering what makes this a table and not a desk. Is it the purpose to which we use it? Yeah. Okay, so if that's it, then what is it now? Table. A bench. It's still a table. This, this is harder than it seems, isn't it? Now, if we can't agree on what this is, can you imagine how much we're going to have a disagreement and a debate about something as difficult as the concept of justice? Right? Which is what I alluded to the last time that I wanted you to start thinking about what is the concept of justice. So the second great question that philosophy attempts to answer is this concept of justice or conduct. What is the best kind of conduct? How do we know that? The, the third type of question that philosophy answers is what you just said, law, governance. What is the best form of government? So these are the perennial issues that have faced all people at all places at all times. The question of knowledge, what is it I can know for certain? Turns out that this may be very difficult. I mean, if we're in the Eastern tradition, this could all be a grand illusion, right? I could be you, you are me, we're the wall, and all of this is in the mind of somebody else. We could be in the matrix, right? I don't know. We could be somebody's game, pawns, right? So what is it we can know? How should we behave, and how should we govern ourselves? Now, obviously, these have implications for marketing, right? Particularly, last time we talked about environmental scanning, one of the things that involves environmental scanning is this idea of regulatory environment, governance. And something else is, what can we know? When we say that 63% of people like a certain product, what does that tell us? What do we know for sure about that? If we have 80% you know, customer approval ratings, which is pretty low, right? What do companies want to tell you? What is Sprint, Verizon, all of these, they, they are advertising to try and get you to switch based on what? What is Verizon's you know, claim to fame? Huh? They have the largest network, right? The largest uh, LTE network in the nation. And more happy and satisfied customers. Well, how do we really know that, right? How many of you have Verizon? How many of you have AT&T? Wow. If I just took a poll of this class, could I say AT&T is, you know, the bomb and Verizon sucks? I don't know. How do we know that? So, and then this question of content, what should we market? So to get you thinking about these things, I wanted to show you a couple of videos, and then what we'll do is we'll break up into your groups, in 122 is the student lounge, I forgot to mention that, there's usually nobody in there at this time. Some of you are looking and I'll open the conference room as well for those of you who want to, uh, to uh, break out so that you can sit down and not have to turn around um, with your group. Let's start with this. Better truth about chocolate and your Easter basket. We're coming up on Easter, aren't we? In fact, Mardi Gras is just around the corner, isn't it? They've already started advertising Mardi Gras parties and things like that, Fat Tuesday. And we end the high season of Easter. This report is part of CNN's Freedom Project. It's a commitment to helping end modern day slavery. The bitter truth behind the chocolate in your Easter basket. It is one of the lead stories on CNN's Autocracy website. It's managing editor, Kat Hensman. She's joining us from New York. So, 
Um, first of all, I mean, it's a lot of people would not suspect that this is happening, that this is taking place. If you're buying chocolate, how do you know whether or not it's actually contributing to child slavery, like the, the little boy we saw there? Well, this is really disturbing and new information to a lot of people, and especially with, since we're coming up upon Easter, which worldwide is the biggest chocolate buying time of the year, we thought we would come up with a list of tips that people can look at to help guide them towards slavery-free chocolate. The first one would be to go organic. Uh, there's very little chance that any organic chocolate that you're going to buy is going to be made with, with slave labor. The trees are generally in, on the average 25 years old and uh, not grown under organic practices and they're not planting new ones. So that's a really great route to go. You should start to consider the origin of where your chocolate is coming from. And if you're looking, and because of the Harkin Angle Act, it's a little bit easier to find out the origins of the cocoa that is used in your chocolate. So while it might be coming from, uh, from Asia or from a few other places, it might not be perfect, but it's better than uh, chocolate you're going to find on from coming from the Ivory Coast. Now, another thing you can do is to look at the labels. Uh, Ethically sourced chocolate is generally going to have a stamp on it that says that it's either uh, Rainforest Association uh, certified or that it's Fair Trade certified. So look at the label and empower yourself that way. And uh, actually one of my favorite routes to go is to really go to the, the local chocolatiers that are springing up all around the country because so many of them uh, have a very direct relationship with the people who are growing the chocolate. And the fewer links in the supply chain, the more accountability there is. And the fewer people who are trying to make a buck off the chain. And they're really working with the farmers directly to get them the best price possible. And, uh, and they're really going to be happy to work with you to develop a taste for this kind of chocolate. And uh, Captain's great. I mean, I've got a, a chocolate place in my own neighborhood that just sprung up, so I, I, I know it's pretty popular. Do, do we have a sense of whether or not this chocolate is like the kind of chocolate we grew up with, and if it's uh, more or less expensive? You know, it may not be exactly like the chocolate you grew up with, but as Kristen Hart from Cacao Atlanta likes to say, one taste and you get it, maybe two tastes. So it might not have quite the butterfat content in it that, that you're used to, or actually, sorry, the, the, uh, the cocoa fat uh, content, but we challenged our uh, eye reporters to come up with recipes that would make people really uh, just since what was wonderful about this, this chocolate, we got everything from sourdough chocolate recipes to chocolate soup to chocolate cookies. And people really put their heart and soul into emphasizing what is beautiful about this chocolate. So what you're really looking for is chocolate that is of great quality, but also makes a difference in the quality of people's lives. That's great. Well, that's a delicious combination there. Thank you. I appreciate it. So I'll show you video on how you identify the, um, how you can identify what the marks look like, the, the service marks for ethically traded uh, chocolate on your candy bars that you buy. You have to put up with the British humor though. Don't settle for 4G LTE coverage that's small or that flat. With only one network America's largest and most reliable 4G LTE network, Verizon. With XLTE, our 4G LTE bandwidth has doubled in over 400 cities. And now, save without settling. Get two lines of 10 gigabytes of data for just $110. Or four lines for just $140. And get a $150 bill credit for each smartphone you switch. Hurry. Offers end January 31st. Only on Verizon. Steve, chocolate and the tasty stuff. But what am I looking for, besides a good bargain, what am I looking for when I'm buying it? You should be looking for chocolate that's a good bargain for you, yes. that's delicious for you, and actually is good news for those who took part in the production. Right, but as I look at this range of chocolate, uh, what are the signs? Point me to the sign. Well, the, the sign is, is quite clear. Here is Cadbury's Dairy Milk, and it's got a fair trade symbol on. Right. It's got a fair trade symbol on because it's been fairly produced. Okay, now there's a lot of chocolate here. A lot of chocolate. Lots of brands, <coughs> lots, lots of, of manufacturers, things. but here's a Kit Kat. A right. four-finger Kit Kat, Nestle, yeah. Kit Kat, fairly traded. How many You've got four bars fairly traded. Four bars not, four bars not. The white ones are not. So why would why would any company not do both? The, the, the truth is this, in order to produce fairly traded cocoa, right. you've got to invest in the lives of those who are producing that cocoa. You've got to treat them fairly. And you say, here's Galaxy. 
and Galaxy says on it, Rainforest Alliance. Rainforest Alliance and Fairly Traded are two different systems, but they both tell you that there was no slavery uh, involved in the production of this bar. CNN asked Nestle, Mars, and Kraft Cadbury why they certify some, but not all, of their products. Frankly, most of them didn't answer the question. Nestle referred us to a statement saying, the company believes child labor has no place in our supply chain. We are firmly committed to eradicate unacceptable practices. Nestle noted they partnered with the Fair Labor Association to investigate their supply chains in West Africa and said, quote, where they find evidence of child labor, the FLA will identify the root causes and advise Nestle how to address them in ways that are sustainable and lasting. Mars, which is the maker of Galaxy, came the closest, saying, while we will label some products, our primary goal is to reach 100% certification by 2020, to encourage more industry commitments to buy larger volumes of certified cocoa. We have launched one of the largest and most comprehensive cocoa sustainability initiatives to reach this ambitious goal. We are working with Rainforest Alliance, Fairtrade International, and UTS Good Inside as part of this effort. We are the only chocolate manufacturer to buy cocoa from all three major certifiers. As for Kraft Cadbury, it simply said, Kraft Foods is working with others in the industry supporting the Harkin Engel Protocol to work towards elimination of the worst forms of child labor in the growing of cocoa beans. If it's fair trade and rainforest alike, they've got less calories. I'm afraid it's still going to make you fat, but you'll be ethically fat. Well, which one are you going to make first? This one. This one's right, yeah. British humor. So, how many of you knew that your it's a chance that your chocolate that you eat, the Reese's, may be made with slave labor. Oh, that video is wrong. Kit Kats are actually not that. Okay, but how many of you knew that? <laughs> not many of you. Some of you are shaking your heads. No, you didn't realize. One of the things in the video, in the full video, the little boy that was shown there growing, um, he didn't even know what cocoa tasted like. Had no idea what it what, what it was what it even tasted like. Never had it, right? So if we think about that, that's a very simple product. It's been around for a long time, right? And it still uh, involves a huge ethical implication and ethical uh, dilemma for us. What about if we get even more complex in our technology and look at something like smartphones, privacy issues, things like that. public and private, which has occurred in the past 10 years. You know the incident, Adam and Eve, uh, one day in the Garden of Eden, realized they are naked, uh, they freak out, and the rest uh, is history. Nowadays, Adam and Eve would probably act differently. We do reveal so much more information about ourselves online than ever before. Uh, so much information about us is being collected by organizations. Now, 
uh, there is much to gain and benefit from this massive analysis of personal information or big data. Uh, but there are also complex trade-offs that come from giving away our privacy. And my story is about these trade-offs. I will start with an observation which in my mind has become clearer and clearer in the past few years that any personal information can become sensitive information. Back in the year 2000, about 100 billion photos were shot worldwide, but only a minuscule proportion of them were actually uploaded online. In 2010, only on Facebook, in a single month, 2.5 billion photos were uploaded, most of them identified. In the same span of time, computers' ability to recognize people in photos improved by three orders of magnitude. What happens when you combine these technologies together? Increasing availability of facial data, improving facial recognizing ability by computers, but also cloud computing, which gives anyone in this theater the kind of computational power which a few years ago was only the domain of three-letter agencies and ubiquitous computing, which allows my phone, which is not a supercomputer, to connect to the internet and do there hundreds of thousands of face matches in a few seconds. Well, we conjecture the result of this combination of technologies will be a radical change in our very notions of privacy and anonymity. To test that, we did an experiment on Carnegie Mellon University campus. We asked students who were walking by to participate in a study. And we took a shot with a webcam, and we asked them to fill out a survey on a laptop. While they were filling out the survey, we uploaded their shot to a cloud computing cluster. And we started using a facial recognizer to match that shot to a database of some hundreds of thousands of images which we had downloaded from Facebook profiles. By the time the subject reached the last page on the survey, the page had been dynamically updated with the 10 best matching photos which the recognizer had found. And we asked the subjects to indicate whether he or she found themselves in the photo. You see the subject? Well, the computer did, and in fact it saw for one out of three subjects. So essentially, we can start from an anonymous face, offline or online, and we can use facial recognition to give a name to that anonymous face, uh, thanks to social media data. But a few years back, we did something else. We started from social media data, we combined it statistically with uh, data from US government social security, and we ended up predicting social security numbers, which in the United States are extremely sensitive information. Do you see where I'm going with this? So if you combine the two studies together, then the question becomes, can you start from a face? And using facial recognition, find a name and publicly available information about that name and that person. And from the publicly available information, infer non-publicly available information, much more sensitive ones, which you link back to the face. And the answer is yes, we can, and we did. Of course, the accuracy keeps getting worse. But in fact, we even decided to develop an iPhone app, which uses the phone internal camera to take a shot of a subject and then upload it to a cloud and then do what I just described to you in real time. Looking for a match, finding public information, trying to infer sensitive information, and then sending it back to the phone so that it is overlaid on the face of the subject. An example of augmented reality, probably a creepy example of augmented reality. In fact, we didn't develop the app to make it available, just as a proof of concept. In fact, take these technologies and push them to their logical extreme. Imagine a future in which strangers around you will look at you through their Google Glasses or one day their contact lenses and use seven or eight data points about you to infer anything else which may be known about you. What will this future without secrets look like? And should we care? We may like to believe that the future with, with so much wealth of data will be a future with no more biases. But in fact, having so much information doesn't mean that we will make uh, decisions which are more objective. In another experiment, we presented to our subjects information about the potential job candidate. We included in uh, this information some references to some funny, absolutely legal, but perhaps slightly embarrassing information that the subject had posted online. Now, interestingly, among our subjects, 
some had possible comparable information, and some had not. Which group do you think uh, was more likely to judge harshly our subject? Paradoxically, it was the group who had posted similar information, an example of uh, moral distance. Now, you may be thinking, this does not apply to me because I have nothing to hide. But in fact, privacy is not about uh, having to something negative to hide. Imagine that you are the HR director of a certain organization, and you receive uh, resumes, and you decide to find more information about the candidates. Therefore, you Google their names, and in a certain universe, you find this information. Or in a parallel universe, you find this information. Do you think that you would be equally likely to call either candidate for an interview? If you think so, then you are not like the US employers who are in fact uh, part of our experiment. Meaning, we did exactly that. We created Facebook profiles manipulating trades, and then we started sending out resumes to company in the US. And we detected, we monitor whether they were searching for our candidates and whether they were active to the information they were finding on social media. And anyway, the discrimination was happening through social media for equally skilled candidates. Now, marketers like us to believe 